All right, so we will go ahead and get started today. Um, for those who are here today or those who are going to be watching on YouTube, thank you for taking the time to, to join this webinar. Uh, my name is Jim Davis. I'm one of the senior wealth planners here at Aspen Wealth Management, alongside my colleague Troy, another financial planner here at Aspen Wealth Management. Um, and today we wanted to, to discuss um, some key components or what we consider kind of core principles that we factor into all of our clients' investment portfolios. Whether you have your money being managed by Aspen or you're doing it yourself, uh, we firmly believe that these are some key principles that everyone should know or be mindful of as they go about um, building a sound investment portfolio. So at Aspen, our core investment philosophy is to, to have a disciplined, academic, um, rigorous approach, regardless of market conditions. We want it to be a, a very strong market position or a very strong investment uh, philosophy that's not um, something that ebbs and flows as the markets ebb and flow, but it's grounded in data, it's grounded in research, and it's it's a goal based plan. But as you know, we are a planning we are a financial planning firm that does investment management, and so what that means is your financial plan always comes first and foremost. Your asset allocation and your investments are simply tools that we use to make your financial plan come to life or come to fruition. And so your goals, your your ambitions to travel or give money to your kids or or retire early, th those are always at the forefront of our minds. And we're thinking, okay, how do we develop an investment portfolio to support those goals as tax efficiently and as cost effectively as possible? To put it plainly, uh, the most fundamental task we tackle with you is aligning your goals and objectives with your investment plan. We do not invest your money without an intimate understanding of your financial background and concerns and believe if you are doing investment management yourself, you should follow the same approach. So what we'll do is we'll go over 10 different principles we believe every investor should consider as they're building out their investment portfolio. And we start with, if I can get my mouse to work, uh, we start with market pricing. Um, as you can see here on the screen, we think all people should believe and embrace market pricing. Um, and what really what that means is, is the market efficient. Okay. Uh, every day, some people say, well, oh, I place this trade and that trade and so the other, but in the, in the, in the grand scheme of the markets, we have nearly $700 billion moving on a daily average between the markets. With each trade, buyers and sellers bring new information to the market, which helps set prices. No one knows what the next bit of information is going to be, and the future is uncertain, so prices adjust accordingly. That's why we often say, you know, uncertainty breeds volatility, right? And so with, you know, there's there is absolutely zero correlation. There will be another webinar we do on this between Republicans and Democrats in office, but there is a correlation typically between volatile uncertainty and volatility, right? Price markets just like certainty, um, and uncertainty is what drives prices to move and capitulate. And just to be clear, this doesn't always mean that a price is always right. There's no way to prove that, but investors can accept the market price as the best estimate of actual value. And if you don't believe that market prices are good estimates, if you believe that the market has it wrong. You're pitting your beliefs against hunches that uh, the collective knowledge of the market participants may have against you. Again, uh, retail investors or things like that. I mean, we're, we're, when you think about the grand scheme of the market, at $700 billion is 2022 numbers. So maybe it's plus or minus that 675 mark. Um, there's always a lot of money movement in a market. And so we like to believe that to keep a, a sound investment portfolio, you should embrace market pricing. The second thing is not to try and outguess the market. I think this slide paired with the next one is fascinating. Um, and I'll talk more about that in my personal experience when I was at a prior firm. Many fund managers, so we're talking kind of mutual fund managers, uh, if you will, believe they can identify mispriced securities and convert that knowledge into higher returns. They want to find the alpha of you know, uh, some secret stock that hasn't popped yet. But fair market pricing works against those efforts as indicated by the large proportion of mutual funds that have underperformed their respective benchmarks. In this chart, the light gray bars represent the number of U.S. domiciled equity, that's stock, and bond or fixed income and bond funds in operation over the last 20 years. Again, the last 20 years, the light gray bar represents all the ones that have been in existence. 
These funds compose the beginning universe of that period. The dark gray show the percentage of equity and fixed income funds that have even survived. So less than half of funds have actually survived, actively managed stock and bond mutual funds have even survived over the last 20 years. The blue and green bars show the smaller percentage of equity and fixed income funds, or so stock and bond funds, that have actually outperformed their respective benchmarks. So over the last 20 years among stock funds, U.S.-based stock funds, we got call it 2,900 funds, less than half of those are even in business today. And of that half, we still only have 17% from the beginning that have actually beat their respective benchmarks. And so one way to look at that is say, well, then why don't I just invest in the 17% that have won or the 14% that have won? But it's not that easy. You know, um, our research shows that over bo both short and long-term horizons, the deck is strongly stacked against mutual funds that attempt to outguess the market. Um, going back to the beginning of the slide, when I was at, I spent my first you know, four or five years at Fidelity Investments, a, a huge um, player in the mutual fund space. And I remember going to a, a kind of a seminar presentation from one of the, the fund managers for one of Fidelity's largest U.S. equity funds. And maybe I was just, I was naive and I raised my hand, I probably shouldn't have, but I asked him at the end of this presentation, because it was very, it was a very impressive. I said, so do I invest in you or do I invest in your fund? And he candidly said, oh, you always invest in me, the fund manager, you know, because I could leave to go to, you know, Guggenheim or a competitor and my strategy would kind of follow suit with me. And my thought there was, well, that's interesting. Like, how is an investor ever to know? you know, if a fund manager left one for the other, how to know if one's good or bad. And so the next slide really bears fruit to that. If you, if you follow this slide and you say, okay, I'm going to invest in the 17% that are winners and the 14% that are winners in the fixed income space, that should be in theory easy to do. But the next component that we strongly emphasize is resist chasing past performance. Some investors see the 17% on the prior slide and go, okay, well, I'm going to put my money there. It's it's worked over the last five or 10 years. Some investors may resort to using track records as a guide to selecting these funds, reasoning that a manager's past performance is likely to continue in the future. But does this assumption pay off? And again, the data, the research has strong evidence to support the contrary. This exhibit shows that among equity funds ranked in the top quartile based on the prior five-year returns, a minority also ranked in the top top quartile of returns in the following five-year period. A lack of persistence casts further doubt on the ability of managers to consistently gain an informational advantage on the market. Let me say that again. A lack of persistence casts further doubt on the ability for fund managers to consistently gain that edge, an informational advantage on the market. Some managers might be better than others, but track records and data alone may not be able to provide enough insight to identify management skill. Stocks and bonds, to be candid, they contain a lot of noise, and impressive track records may result from good luck. The assumption that strong past performance will continue often proves faulty, leaving many investors disappointed. Um, and th you see this oftentimes when we work with clients. We ask them, how, how did you pick the funds in your 401k plan? They say, well, they did the best over the last 10 years. And, and so that's kind of what bears fruit to the expression past performance is not indicative of future results or returns. Okay. The next component um, that we strongly believe in is just letting markets work for you. Okay. Um, what you see here is a really, I think is a really fascinating graph over time from 1926 until 2022. Uh, you see, you know, the, the impacts of inflation and treasury bills and bonds and kind of what they've done over time. And sure, there's volatility, um, but there's a pretty wide delta between what treasury bills and inflation have done relative to the, the U.S. stock market. OK, most people look at the financial markets as their main investment avenue. And the good news is that capital markets have rewarded long term investors. The markets represent capitalism at work in the economy, and historically, free markets have provided a long-term return that substantially offset inflation. This is documented in this graph we're looking at here, which shows monthly performance of various indices in inflation since 1926. These indices represent different areas of the U.S. financial markets, such as stocks and bonds, and 
The data illustrates the beneficial role of having stocks in a portfolio over time. But cheap bills and treasury bills and bonds, um, while they cover inflation, uh, and, and bonds have obviously exceeded treasury bills, um, U.S. stocks do return over time. Have the, I'm sorry, U.S. stocks returns have far exceeded inflation and significantly outperformed bonds over time. It's not to say, to be very clear, it's not to say that one is better than the other. They both serve very important and key roles in a portfolio. Um, but if you're constantly looking to keep a, a portfolio ahead of inflation, which is a real, uh, you know, and we've experienced this in the last several years, it's a real beast. You've got to have some money exposed to equities or in something that's going to outpace inflation. And historically speaking, U.S. stocks or equities um, have done that. Another key point, like you see here on the graph, is not all stocks and bonds are the same. For example, like consider the performance of U.S. small cap stocks versus large cap stocks over this period of time. A dollar invested in small cap stocks in 1926 would be worth considerably more today than a dollar invested in the large cap stocks. And so, you know, because not all stocks are equal, um, you want to have exposure to both and you want to maybe tilt or lean into one. And so... There's an expression that I heard once that I liked, and it's, you should buy the world and buy it for cheap. And so we, we firmly believe in Aspen having a globally diversified portfolio, but it's also okay to kind of lean into certain areas or asset classes more than others if we feel um, confident and the data suggests that those are going to perform or outperform standard benchmarks over time. And um, what I'd say also here, keep in mind that there is risk and uncertainty in markets. We know that, you know, risk and return are correlated. Um, historical returns um, and results may not be repeated in the future, but nevertheless, the market is consistently pricing securities to reflect a positive expected return going forward. Otherwise, people wouldn't invest their capital at all. When you see a stock price, what you're often seeing is the forward projecting of what someone thinks it's worth down the road. So I think this, this graph is a, a good illustration of kind of the compound effects of U.S. stocks versus inflation and bonds over time. The next component we're gonna talk about are what we call the consider, uh, the drivers of return. So like what goes into a stock return, right? These, these things move every day. If you check your accounts intraday, you're gonna see ups and downs and there's volatility uh, this way and the other. Um, but what we wanna look at are the drivers of returns. Like what is truly pushing returns of stock prices? Because when you kind of look under the hood, that can really inform your decisions as you invest in the stock market or the bond market. Um, there's a, obviously, a, I can read off the slide, there's a wealth of research into what drives returns. Um, but what we'll do is we'll kind of focus on stocks and then bonds each at a time. Rather than viewing the market universe in terms of individual stocks and bonds, investors should define the market along the dimensions of expected returns to identify broader areas that have similar or relevant characteristics. This approach or this strategy, it, it's, it's more rig rigorous to be candid, but... Um, it relies on academic research, internal testing to identify these dimensions and hopefully point to differences in expected returns over time. So in the equity market, if we strip out like what are the drivers of returns? Dimensions are size. You see this in a normal quadrant. So size being small companies versus large companies. Um, you've sometimes heard us say like the Russell 2000 or the Russell 3000 versus the Dow. Um, to, to put it in a, a simple term, um, it's not uncommon for folks to say, yeah, I hear the Dow is up or the Dow is down. Well, the Dow only represents 30 companies in the United States. The S&P 500 represents 500. And the Russell 2000, as you guessed it, it's not, not too catchy. It represents over 2,000 companies in the U.S. stock market, around 2,000 companies. So size is a key component, small companies versus large companies. The next component is price to book, what we call value or growth or relative price. Um, this is where you might find a lot of similar language like how Warren Buffett operates at Berkshire Hathaway, okay? So a growth company is a stock or a company that's not kicking out a lot of dividends, they're trying to grow. So think the FANG stocks, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. These are companies that are trying to grow and so rather than distributing their profits, right, or having a lot of cash on their balance sheets, you can kind of nix Apple there. They're trying to grow. They're trying to reinvest in their business to grow and be a growth stock, okay? Value stocks are different. Value stocks are companies with more, maybe more cash on their balance sheets. They produce dividends. 
Um, and they're not, to be clear, they're not as volatile as a growth stock, you know, with a lot more fluctuations because, you know, when you have a, a company with strong cash on their balance sheets, you know, you're not as, uh, the, the price isn't going to be as sensitive if, you know, things in the market go awry. They know they're in a financially stable position more so than a company that's, you know, all in on growth and doesn't have a lot of profits, which leads us to the last point, profitability. Companies with strong operating profits are operating to book equity, right? This is on the stock piece. So when we're looking at stocks, we're saying, okay, is this a small or big company? Is this a medium sized company? What's the relative price? You know, what's the, is it a value or growth company? And what's the profitability of this company? And these factors really drive returns on the equity side. On the fixed income market, these dimensions are term, credit, and currency, okay? The return differences between stocks and bonds can be considerably large as the return differences amongst a group of bonds and uh, um, among a group of stocks or bonds. So on the fixed income side, we often talk about, you hear the word duration, that comes up quite a bit. So um, that that's kind of more in line on the term side. And so term could be, for example, a short term bond versus a bond that's you know 10 or 15 or 20 years out there or old. And so if, if I put it plainly, um, the shorter the bond, ordinarily, the less volatile the bond is. But when you give up um, tar term length, so if you go from a short-term bond to a long-term bond, ordinarily, and historically speaking, the short-term bonds don't pay as much interest as bonds that, you know, because you're taking on more risk, owning a bond for a longer period of time. That hasn't been the case in recent years uh, with interest rates being as volatile as they've been and, and kind of moving upwards and now leveling off. But uh, nevertheless, term is a key component. Credit quality, you know, this is where you see like triple A's, or triple B's or single A's. You know, that's a big factor in like the types of bonds you hold and the interest rates you receive. And then the currency of issuance, you know, are these U.S. domestic bonds, things like that. To be considered a dimension, each of these six items are considered a dimension. It must be sensible. It must be backed by data over time and across markets. And it must be cost effective to catch your capture in diversified portfolios. Of all the slides, this is probably the most technical and nuanced, so I apologize if I'm, if I'm losing you there. I, and uh, But I want to make sure you understand, when we look at a portfolio, it's not just about stocks and bonds. It's about what types of stocks, about what types of bonds you hold in your portfolio, and that can significantly impact your returns over time. In a dimensions-based approach, capturing returns does not involve predicting which stocks or bonds or markets are going to outperform in the future. Rather, the goal is to hold a well-diversified portfolio that emphasizes dimensions of higher expected returns while controlling costs and having low turnover. So we want expect higher expected returns. We want as low cost as possible, right? Uh, because the less you pay in costs and fees, the more you keep in your pocket. And if we also can accomplish having a low turnover, that also reduces your tax liability um, for those who have assets in taxable and non-retirement accounts. The next core component we're going to look at is smart diversification. This one, I cannot emphasize enough. I cannot tell you how many folks say, I'm invested. I'm in the S&P 500. It's like, great. You're invested in 500 of the largest growthy companies in the United States. And it's true. 500 is better than, I would argue, someone picking and choosing an individual stock here and there but I still wouldn't consider it a, a diversified portfolio. Many people concentrate their investments in their home stock market, call it like a hometown bias. They might consider their portfolio diversified when they choose a large group of US stocks or US mutual funds, but in some cases they still only hold a small group of US companies. Yet, from a global perspective, limiting one's investment universe to a handful of stocks or even a few hundred in the US um, is a concentrated strategy with possible risk and return implications. Again, um, risk and return are correlated. It can certainly do well, and there are decades and periods of time where it has done well. But if we are investing for our client's retirement, you know, we're ordinarily looking at a long-term time horizon. We're talking 20, 30, 40 years or more. And if we're looking over that scope, we have to, we have to always be mindful of that frame of reference. We have to always be looking at the forest through the trees it's very easy with recency bias to be like, well, over the last 12 months, my cast on this. But when you peel back and you kind of get, see the, the forest or the trees, not the tree through the forest, and you look at a global perspective, 
Um, that's not oftentimes the best trade to make. Okay. This slide offers a conceptual comparison of investing only in the U.S. stock market, which is, again, the, the S&P 500 index, versus structuring a globally diversified portfolio that holds assets and markets around the world, as represented by the MSCI All Country World Index. For the global portfolio, holding thousands of stocks across the world's developed and emerging market countries broadens one's investment universe. A diversified portfolio should be structured to hold multiple asset classes that represent different market areas across the world. One um, metaphor, one, I guess, analogy I like to use is if I gave to, to clients, and if you're a client of mine on this call, you probably heard me say this before, um, but I have three boys and, and they're, they're, they're wild and crazy, but <laughs> they're mine. Uh, and I gave one of my sons a pencil. And I asked him to break that pencil in half with his hands. He could probably do it. Um, but if I gave him, I don't know, half a dozen, if I gave him six pencils, it would probably be a little more difficult. And then when I give him 20 pencils and I wrap a rubber band around it and I ask him to break the stack of pencils, you're, you're going to understand how difficult that might be. And maybe it's a visceral thing that you can think about right now um, with that same analogy. What we want our clients to have are thousands of companies in their portfolio so yeah if you go to if you go to take those 20 pencils and you try and break them in half you may have some crack on the periphery but as a whole it's going to be a relatively strong portfolio because there's a lot of companies that won't be impacted by certain you know factors in the market or certain countries that do well when others don't or certain asset classes that perform better than others when others succeed and there's no better chart than the next two slides to kind of drive home that same point Avoiding market timing. You know, we talk about being globally diversified here. This is a great example of that. Even with a globally diversified portfolio, market movements can tempt investors to switch asset classes based on predictions of future performance. This slide features annual ranked performances of major asset classes in the U.S. and international markets over the last 15 years. The asset classes are represented by corresponding market indices, and the patchwork dispersion of colors shows that the relative performance of asset classes is unpredictable at best. Investors who follow a structured, diversified approach are well positioned to seek returns whenever and wherever they occur. Diverse, diversification also reduces the risk of being heavily invested in an underperforming asset group in any given year. Um, I, the, to be, to be candid, I, I often joke with clients that, you know, our portfolios, you know, they're not sexy. Um, they're not going to swing up and down and make a, a, a large windfall overnight, but they're likely not going to fall the same either. You know, it's like, it's like gravity. Anything that rises fast can fall faster, even faster. And so what we want to have for our clients are globally diversified portfolios that are consistent over time. Sure, we may have some that are more aggressive than others because they lean more into stocks than bonds or fixed income. But what we want to have our, for our clients as they near retirement is they want to have a stay rich portfolio versus a get rich portfolio. It's not uncommon for us to meet with folks and they're getting close to retirement, they, maybe a few years out. And I look at their account, I'm like, man, this thing is, it is aggressive. It is l almost all stocks across the board. And that may have been a great trade for them. But what we, we strongly emphasize to clients is that the portfolio that gets you to retirement should look very different than the one that gets you through retirement. As your income needs arise, as your earning potential diminishes because you're retired, and you now need to live off this portfolio. You now somehow have to recreate this your salary to maintain your lifestyle using the assets that you've saved over the years. And so, yeah, that does mean potentially giving up returns because you're reducing your risk. But what it also does is it ensures that you have your money set aside enough asset classes like fixed income markets or such that, um, you know, if volatility does occur, you're not having to sell stocks at a loss to maintain your lifestyle or even worse. I recently had a client who wanted to maintain a very aggressive portfolio. And uh, I said, what would happen if the market took a, you know, a 10 or 12 percent downturn and we're all in on stocks? And he goes, well, we just wouldn't travel that year. I was like, well, that. That to us is counterintuitive to what we said at the very beginning. Your financial plan and your goal should come first. Your investments 
should be specifically, you know, diversified in a way to complement or make that financial plan come to life. I like this slide so much that I'm going to do it again. This is, is uh, the same kind of information, but on a grander scale. This is called the Callan Periodic Table of Investment Returns. And if you want to take a picture of your phone or screenshot this, or this, this recording will be available on YouTube after this presentation. But the Callan Periodic Table of Investment Returns conveys the strong case for diversification across all asset classes, stocks and bonds, capitalizations, you can see large versus small, and equity markets, okay? So this this is a, a great chart to kind of illustrate, man, there's certain years people have said over the last 10 years, why would you ever invest in emerging markets or international markets? Well, let's look at 2005 and six and seven, eight, or I mean, 2004 through 2009, um, really 2004, 2013, you know, non, non-US markets did really well, emerging markets in particular. How about real estate? Real estate always makes money. Well, it didn't in 2020, definitely didn't in 2022. And so what we suggest is having a portfolio that has all these things. Um, and so that way you're, you, you maintain a consistently diversified portfolio. And I like to use the analogy that we want a portfolio that's hitting consistent singles and doubles, not home runs or strikeouts. And so I, I think this is a great graph to kind of illustrate the importance of diversification and um, why you should always avoid market timing, not even on a stock basis, but on an asset class basis as well. The next component is managing your emotions. Okay, this is you know, this is not something that we can quantify like we can with returns over time, um, but you, you would be shocked at how often you know when we meet with folks we're talking them off the ledge of and and some of our clients they're amazing brilliant rational uh people they're engineers or they're physicians or they're teachers and, and anywhere across the board um but there's something about money and what it does to our psyche and so what we suggest is never reactively investing based on the market um you know fear is it does funny things when you've worked so hard for so long to a portfolio. So one hedge against that is to never have your portfolio so aggressive that if the market were to fluctuate, it would give you that anxiety to make a significant trade or go all out and go to cash and you know put money under your mattress. The 2008-2009 global market downturn offers an example of how the cycle of fear and greed can drive an, drive an investor's reactive decisions. Some investors flood the market in 2009 just before the rebound began, and they locked in those losses and experienced the stress of watching the markets climb for years and years. Staying disciplined through rising and falling markets can pose a challenge, but it is crucial, absolutely crucial for long-term success. I know candidly with when COVID happened, I, I, my phone was ringing off the hook of clients, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And I said, we need to stay the course. We need to be patient. Um, if anything, we, we can buy things on a discount right now because the markets have dropped so fast, but unlike almost any other market before it rebounded even faster. It seemed like, I mean, it was just overnight, the market snapped back and timing the market. What people sometimes fail to recognize with market timing is it, it's, it's easy to understand when you've made money. If you go to a casino and you've got a lot of, you start with a hundred bucks and you got 500 bucks on the table. It's easy to identify when you made money. And so selling at the top, no one will ever know when the top is, but selling at a profit is not difficult to do. Um, but if the market swings, and, and let's say you make that trade right, you time the, the top of the market, and you, you sell out of that position, then the market goes down like you perfectly predicted. Who is to say or ever know when the bottom is? Because what often happens is you have like a false bottom or you have... Um, the market, um, it, it starts rebounding and you get all these folks on CNBC who say, well, we're no, this just a, it's a false bottom. It's going to go back down. And then it doesn't, it keeps climbing and climbing. And so by the time you get into the market again, you missed out on sizable returns because you just, there's no way of timing that it's a two part trade, not only figuring out the top of the market, but the bottom of the market. And the reason why historically speaking, it never works over the long term. The next component that we need to talk about is looking beyond the headlines. Um, a dimensional fund is a, is a company we, we uh, respect a great deal, similar to Vanguard and some other institutions. 
Um, and they used to have a, um, a presentation. They actually called financial, I think it was financial pornography or something to that effect. Um, they've had to um, rephrase it to uh, something a lot more mild. But the, the, the message stays the same. And um, it's understanding that fear sells. Um, it's understanding that headlines, uh, the, the purpose of people writing these articles is to get clicks, right? News and financial commentary can influence people's view of investing and be some of the most counterproductive um, information you can read or consume as it actually pertains to your retirement portfolios. Without a strong investment philosophy to guide investors, you know, folks who follow the news may follow, you know, advice of friends or neighbors also and and these random insights from strangers who know nothing about their financial plan, um, and it, it leads to them making reactive decisions in their investments uh, and, and significantly impacting their returns over time. But to be frank, folks, growing wealth has no shortcuts. Success requires a solid investment approach, a long-term perspective, and discipline to stay the course. Okay. Some folks say it's like a get rich slow scheme. You know, um, you, you you buy the world, you buy it for cheap. Um, that, and what that means is you buy a globally diversified portfolio, you keep your costs low, um, you kind of keep your head you know head down, and you just keep plugging along over time. Um, and, and folks who I see that with a lot of our clients at Aspen, we we see that with folks who have maybe large four hundred one k balances or IRAs. And the reason. Um, it's nice to work with folks like that is is because it's really hard to get 401k rich. It's really hard to hit seven figures in a retirement account only because there's only so much you can put into a retirement account per year. If you sell a business and have a windfall of cash, you can become a millionaire in a pretty short amount of time. Uh, but to be a millionaire through an IRA or 401k means you, you've consistently maybe made maximum contributions or at least recurring contributions over a long period of time. And you've also been patient. You know, um, you understand like the discipline that comes with investing over a prolonged period of time and that it's, it is kind of a get rich slow scheme. Um, but statistically speaking, the most lucrative trade to make is to not make a trade at all. It's just to stay invested in a really well-built portfolio. The next slide, uh, this is our last kind of key component. It is focusing on what you can control. So to have a better investment experience, People should focus on things they can control. Um, it, it starts with an advisor or someone who is doing this themselves by creating an investment plan based on market principles, informed by data and financial science, and most, most importantly, tailored to a client's specific needs and goals. Along the way, a good financial planner can help clients focus on actions that add investment value such as managing expenses, reducing or lowering portfolio turnover, while also remaining globally diversified or broadly diversified. Equally important, an advisor can provide knowledge and encouragement to help investors stay disciplined through various market conditions, talking someone off a ledge or, hey, um, let's put some of that cash to work and let's, you know, inflation's a real thing. Let's, let's stay, let's, let's see what we can do to stay ahead of inflation. We never want a client to uh, invest so aggressively that it, it you know, makes them, you know, I guess, take in assets at night. But we want, we want to make sure clients' portfolio is reflective of their risk tolerance and their risk capacity, uh, that they have the means to take on a certain amount of risk, but also that they have the stomach for it. There's no sense in putting a client in a portfolio that's so aggressive that if the market takes a swing one or the other, they're going to they're gonna tap out because that's not helpful to anybody, especially um, the clients and their loved ones over time. So when you look at this slide, I think it's very important to note and to circle back all the way to the beginning, your financial plan is the cornerstone. Your investment plan, your, your financial plan that involves your goals, your needs, your, your, um, your passions and desires. I, I hate to get sound cheesy there, but do we want to travel in retirement? Do we want to buy that second property? Do we want to you know, spoil our kids? Do we want to pay for that wedding or our kids college? All of these things are what drive our, you know, these are the things that we wake up about. You know, I have three boys and, and my wife and my three boys, they are my world. And I wake up uh, and I love what I do. I, I genuinely, genuinely, genuinely love what I do. But it's never lost on me that Part of my role is to is to work hard to take care of them. And we have goals as a family, and I'm sure you do too. 
And so what I like to say is my client's financial plan, there needs to be a connective tissue between their investments and their financial plan. So at any point in time, when you look at your investment portfolio, you go, ah, I know I'm investing this way. It's for my spouse or my kids or my grandkids. It's for college. It's for all these things. Um, m- making money for the sake of money, it, obviously it can be done. But at Aspen, we are a planning first firm and we want to plan our clients' lives to be full and rich lives that extend far beyond a balance sheet. And so your investments, all these different asset classes and stocks and bonds and the whole gambit, these are simply tools we use to make your financial plans come to fruition. And so by focusing on what you can control, um, looking at these core components you see here on the screen, the 10 we talked about today, um, we think there's no better way to go about investment management than to kind of follow these key investment philosophies um, to, to really focus on what we can control and to do everything in our power to make sure that our investment portfolios are in complete alignment with our financial plans. And that may change season to season, but that we regularly can look back at our investment accounts and go, okay, I know exactly why I'm invested this way because this is helping me accomplish you know, th- this, that, or the other for my family. And so that, that wraps up today's presentation on the 10 um, elements that go into making a, a strong investment portfolio, especially for folks in retirement. And so I'm gonna take a moment here. I know we've had some questions come in before today's presentation and you might have had some come through in the chat. As I'm pontificating, I don't have the ability to kind of see those come through. So I'm gonna like kind of Troy take the reins here and uh, maybe throw some questions my way or I may have a question for him or two to clarify, but um, I appreciate all of you for taking the time to watch this today. For those who are going to be watching it on YouTube, I appreciate you all as well. And I know a lot of folks have been watching this on YouTube or sharing it with their loved ones. And that does mean a great deal because a lot of time, energy, and effort goes into putting these together for you all. And and, and I love doing it candidly. So thank you for taking the time today. Thanks, everyone. So, Jim, I'm only seeing one question in the chat as of now, but uh, it, it's uh, don't some large U.S. companies offer access to global markets? Yes, that's a great point. And so that at Aspen, candidly, one of the kind of the tilts we have is we lean a little more into U.S. stocks. It's it's hard for anyone to argue that Apple is a U.S. company and not a global company. Um, and so when I look at asset classes, we are by no means market tra- timers or pontificators. But when we as a firm make a decision, a lot of firms do this, we have what's called like a, a domestic and small cap value tilt primarily. Um, we still invest in everything, but we lean into those companies because historically speaking, the a lot of the companies on the U.S. stock market, particularly the S&P 500, have international sales and a lot of their revenue is generated internationally. And so we feel comfortable kind of leaning more into U.S. equities than maybe the, the global index would suggest. But that's just because we feel confident that a lot of large U.S. companies are, in fact, global, international, like Netflix and Apple, and, and there's just to name a few. I know my wife and I, we went to Cabo not long ago, uh, or about a year ago, and I was shocked. I was like, oh, there's a Walmart, you know, like um, in Mexico. And so um, I think that kind of speaks to the question of, yes, a lot of U.S. companies or U.S. domiciled companies on the S&P 500 or just S&P at large are truly, you know, global companies that have a lot of international exposure and revenue. Another question that just came in was, uh, what determines whether a large or small cap kick out a dividend? I mean, really, that's a hard, um, it's based on every company, their board of directors and decisions they make, kind of what to do with their profits. Does the company decide? It's And it's really no different than a small business. So rather than thinking large or small companies, um, think about it this way. If you own and operated your own small business, any client out there, any person out there, um, and you had profits left over. So let's say you as a small business are making $500,000 a year in revenue, but you've got to pay rent, you've got to pay your staff, you've got to pay insurance, you've got to pay technology, you got to pay all these things. And at the end of the day, you're left with a 20% profit margin. So you got got 100 grand left over. Do you choose to take that $100,000 and distribute it to the owner? Or do you choose to take that $100,000 and to reinvest it in your company to buy a second property for potentially a second location? Or if you're a landscaping company, do you buy more trucks and do you you try and scale up your business? 
Um, that same logic applies to what we call value or growth oriented companies. And it's going to vary company to company and candidly board to board and shareholder to shareholder and how they vote. Um, some companies, you know, they, they get into a point where they're like, you know what, we want to kind of, we want to maintain our position on the market and stay level. We're really focused on dividends and interest, but others want to reinvest in their company and grow. Um, and so we like to have a, a blended approach to both. I think there's value in having growth companies. There's a, a, a lot of value in having value companies. And so it's not a, an either or you want to have kind of a yes and approach to your investment portfolio. Not seeing any other questions in the chat, but, uh, one question we received the most before the webinar was just the difference between asset allocation versus location. It, People on the this uh, webinar have been in meetings with us, which a lot of you have. Um, you know the difference, but just quick overview, the differences between the two. Allocation, as many of you know, is just different asset classes, industries, objectives within your portfolio. And uh, it's just as important to focus on asset location. So what is that? Essentially, just different tax buckets to your portfolio that allow you to mitigate your tax burden as well as vary your strategy among those different accounts like cash and your short-term investments versus your taxable pre-tax and post-tax, all with different purposes allowed for proper tax planning, flexibility. And so, for example, more aggressive in your tax-free accounts versus your pre-tax so that we can artificially manage your tax burden approaching and during retirement. So if you get started early, essentially it gives you more flexibility to manage not only your investment returns, but also how those investment returns are affected by your tax situation. So yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. I had a, I had a client not long ago. He had, he said, why is my wife's account, why are her returns so much better than mine? I said, well, <laughs> candidly, like his account was a pre-tax, it is a pre-tax IRA account. Um, and his wife's account is a Roth account, you know, and when we look at a client's account at Aspen, we, we're not looking at, I mean, we look at every individual account, but we're looking at their household portfolio. And so as you suggested with tax-free assets, Roth accounts, because of all the tax advantages and they'll never have RMDs and the kids can get, you know, that money tax-free if they were to inherit it. We want those accounts ordinarily to be more aggressive. Um, and some folks come to us with a huge pre-tax bucket, like 401ks and IRAs, and if you let those get too, if you get those at a hand, it can really throw off their required minimum distributions. And what does that do? It increases their income and it can potentially impact their Medicare premiums. And so I said, well, you know, John Doe, I was like, you know, if we let your portfolio get really aggressive, um, what that could end up doing is actually negatively impacting your Medicare premiums and your costs. And so as a household, we had them right in line with where we wanted them from the stocks to bonds or money in the market, out of the market. How we got there was by focusing on having the right asset classes and the right tax buckets or locations, as you suggested, to essentially generate the most tax efficient retirement income plan for them and their family. All right, we just got another question, Jim. So regarding fixed income, does Aspen lean toward ETF and mutual fund investments or direct ownership of corporate and government bonds? 22, 2022 was painful. Yeah. Well, so there's, that's kind of a two, I'll answer that in two ways. Uh, we as a firm are very, uh, very proud of how our fixed income portfolio held up during that time. Because when we go back to this slide right here, let's see here, this slide right here. On a term standpoint, the bond market as a whole was just beat to a pulp. Um, folks who had like ag, the general bond market fund out there in the in the world, like the AGG, the general bond market was pummeled by interest rates. Aspen around that time had d made a decision, fortunately, um, before a lot of that volatility would occur to shorten the duration of the term of our portfolios. So it wasn't really subject to interest rate risk. We were willing to give up yield, like saying, hey, we're, you know, we, know, we know we're potentially giving up interest rate, you know, income. But what we're really designing our fixed income portfolio to do is to be a ballast. And so Aspen's position is it's our bond portfolio is made up of a few different ETFs and funds. Um, it depends on the account. And the reason, I mean, one of the reasons I love working at Aspen is we're very intentional about having a, a very low um, client to advisor ratio. 
And so we never just fire sell a client's account when they come over. We oftentimes, if they come to us with individual bonds, um, we're going to evaluate every single position and we're going to keep what we like. You know, we're independent. We don't have to answer to anyone. So we're going to keep what we like and what's in alignment with their financial plan. And yeah, we'll probably discard what's not, you know, um, economically viable for them. But as a whole, um, when we're building a portfolio, let's say from scratch, we use a combination of mutual funds and exchange traded funds. Um, but our, our, our mentality, our, our overall strategy is that the role of bonds in our clients' portfolios are not to go grab a bunch of interest. They're not high yield plays. They're designed to be a stabilizing ballast in their portfolio. And so this is where our clients will tr traditionally generate their income they need for retirement. And so what we do is um, we shorten the duration, which is what you see as the term there. We increase the credit. We want high quality companies. Okay, those aren't as volatile as you know Indonesian junk bonds or anything. Um, and then we we stay close to home. We like U.S. stuff. We like treasuries. And again, we're we're still going to have exposure to everything, but we lean into um, the parts of the fixed income market that we think are more safe and secure. Um, and we're willing to give up a little bit of interest. Uh, to maintain preservation of capital, if that if that answers your question. So the role for a bond, I guess, let me, I keep talking, but the role of bonds and clients' portfolios at Aspen ordinarily is to be a stabilizing position, kind of a ballast. And and so we, we are willing to give up some interest for that so that if you know, volatility does occur, their bond positions are not negatively impacted like the general bond market was in recent years. Any other questions? Those are all great questions, by the way. Yeah. And if you do have questions about that, myself or Troy, Nathan Davis on our team uh, is, is our chief investment officer. He would be a fantastic resource to pick his brain about kind of our strategies. Um, what I would suggest for those who ask questions today, please go to our YouTube channel. We recently had a quarterly market update and Nathan uh, actually went to great lengths to explain kind of how our portfolios are positioned and specifically right. spent some time on the fixed income side as well. And so I think it would be a great uh, a great resource to kind of check out that quarterly market update webinar. Um, Troy, you were on that webinar. I know we spent a great deal of time on that. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, it's You're covering, covering 10 of our principles, but it, it dives deeper into our investment philosophy and the, more of the specifics around how we tailor our portfolios to our clients and um, just our model portfolios in general. So yeah, if, if anyone has questions or curious to hear more, please email either of us or Nathan. It's Nathan has the same email, just replace his name for the for the info email at the beginning or uh, just reach out. Yeah, we'd be happy to discuss more. Watch our webinars either way. Awesome. Well, thank you all for taking the time. I know taking an hour out of your, out of the middle of your week. So I appreciate you all very much. And um, if you do, I think I saw, maybe I'm just delayed on the chat. Um, but sincerely, thank you all for doing this. So we put a lot of energy and effort into this. And so um, it means a lot that you guys stick around. We appreciate y'all. And this will be available. It'll probably be resent back out to you in the next week or so um, to watch this recording. And again, it'll be available on our YouTube once we get it all set up. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Great. That's your day.